So you're back from Hawaii, right? Yeah, it was a quick trip. Very quick trip. Went to support my friend on his 40th birthday. It's a really neat place, isn't it? I had no idea. What stunned me maybe the most about it was that like the majority of Maui looks like kind of scrubby southeastern California kind of territory. Then you get a little bit of bamboo forest. Yeah. And a little bit of what you'd expect, you know, and a little bit of Ireland at like the northwest coast of Maui. It looks like Ireland or like Western UK. It's it's a strange place, man. Beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome. What was your uh, your main takeaway? Well, OK, I, I warned you about this a little bit that I had a question coming out of this that I wanted to bounce off you. And so I'll just spring it here. The main takeaway was I flew over all of this ocean and I kept looking out the window and seeing nothing but ocean forever. I'm a little bit familiar with the geography of the, the Pacific. And I just got to thinking, how did people find this place? I, I have the luxury of being at whatever, 35,000 feet, and I couldn't point you in the right direction. How did somebody in a boat find these tiny little rocks in the middle of the ocean in the first place? It's a really good question. How did humans find Hawaii? When you mentioned this idea to me, I went to some different places in my mind. So I want to talk about how you find a place if you don't know it's there, and then how you find a place if you do know it's there. That's kind of the thing I think we should talk about a little bit. I think we should also then talk about how do you know a place is there that you haven't been to? Right. Because I think that's a really key question in how this all worked out, is that people knew it had to be there, but they hadn't been there. I don't know that they thought it had to be there. We're talking about the sailors of old, the Polynesian sailors that first found the islands. So are we going to limit this discussion to only Hawaii? We're just going to talk about islands in the middle of the Pacific in general. How do you want to do this? We are not good at setting ground rules for our conversations, either with or without microphones. So I think whatever happens is what happens. Okay. This is where I want to start then. So when you told me this is what we're going to talk about, I started thinking about it in terms of us on Earth looking out into space. And I think a lot of the same types of things that apply with how these ancient seafaring peoples found these far-off islands... I think a lot of these same rules apply. We're just in a different stage of civilization at this point. Eventually, I want the conversation to go there. Okay. And that makes sense that you would want it to go there. Um, I feel like you're framing that from the perspective of this impulse for exploration is kind of inevitable wherever you are. Is that what I'm hearing in you? And is like when you, whenever you talk about space, there's this, I don't know, maybe inevitability is too strong a word, but... It's like it's there so it can't help but be explored, even though there's great risk and all of this other stuff that goes into it. So you're kind of framing this from a humanities point of view that hey, that hey space one exploration, second. Earth there's expo- a phone. I, I got to get this phone call. It may be an astronaut. Not joking. Oh, I'll just yep. hang on one second. Go get it. Hello. Open enrollment is here. This is affordable health care insurance. <laughs> insurance policies have all been reduced nationwide. <laughs> Oh, are you still there? What? Yeah, I'm here. What? It was not an astronaut. (laughs) Who was it? It was one of those scams or something like that. (laughs) But I was like, (laughs) I'm expecting a call from an astronaut. And I was like, oh, this might be him. I got to get it. And I'm like, "Uh, one second, Matt, I'm going to get a call from an astronaut. If you could just wait. Healthcare enrollment is now available in your area. That's exactly what it said. I have it recorded. Really? It was that one? Yeah, it was. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, and and as as soon as it happened, I was like, man, I'm a jerk. (laughs) I felt kind of important there. And now I'm just stupid. (laughs) So you were yet... You were like all the people who have the phones, who get calls from the open healthcare enrollment. Where were we at? Yeah, exploration in general. So if you think about it, imagine the known world that you exist in. My children, for example. I got them, or my mother-in-law actually bought them a machete and a hatchet, which I was very, very proud that she did that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and we got a BB gun, and I took them to the woods and I said, hey, there's a big tree back there. I need you guys to go take a picture of it for me. 
and I just pulled up on the side of the road in these woods, dropped them off, and just let them go. Let them explore. They know what to do. They know what to do. Yep. If you give them weapons or a thing to carry... They called them weapons. They even more know what to do. Yeah, exactly. Like, did you do that as a kid? Heck yeah. Are you kidding me? There was uh, across the street at Sacred Heart Church and Corresponding School in Maquoketa, Iowa, when I was a little kid, there was this grate that led down to some kind of tunnels or catacombs that we were just sure was under there and it was hiding like super secret Catholic stuff, like maybe Vatican documents. I don't know. Yeah. But we wanted so badly to figure out how to pry off that grate. And we eventually got together this enormous cohort of neighborhood kids (laughs) and using bikes and ropes, we pulled that grate off and we went under the parking lot at Sacred Heart Catholic Church and corresponding religious school. And there were no secrets from the Knights Templar or anything under there. It kind of smelled like poop and we were too afraid to go in any direction, but it felt like Goonies and we all wanted to be a part of that because, well, I think that's why Goonies resonates with you. You just want to explore. Of course I did that. What did you explore when you were a kid? Back on the hill behind our house, there was this water tower. And when I was a kid, my dad used to take me up there. We'd walk our dogs up there. And we're talking like, this is a significant walk. This is an adventure. And... Every Sunday afternoon, a friend would come over, and we would just go do something. We'd go off into the woods. And then one Sunday afternoon, his name was Stephen. We went out into the woods near the water tower. This was maybe 45 minutes walk from home. And we found a cave, like a big cave, a big hole in the ground. And it was like, imagine you're at the mouth of a cave that's kind of like at a 45-degree angle on an embankment. Right on. And you're looking down in it. And there's a slope down. It's like a slow ramp that you go down in this cave. Well, we didn't really have any flashlights or anything with us, but we decided to go in there. It's like, oh, that's we could get right back out. Walked down in there, and when the first layer of leaves kind of slid out from under our feet, it was all guano, all bat crap. And, And it was all slippery. And we got down in there, and we could not get out. We slid down in there. We're like, uh, we're stuck in a cave. <laughs> so, is that bad? Yeah. I mean, uh, at some point, you want to be stuck in a cave. Uh, yeah, but not when you don't know. You know, nobody knows where you're at. Not this sort of situation. And so, it took us about twenty minutes. But we we figured out. Okay, let's get some rocks, and we kind of shoved these rocks down in the guano. I mean, it was a lot, man. We assumed it was guano because of the consistency. It's really slick and stuff like that. Very unlike the soil in the area. And uh, we eventually got back out, but it was fascinating. It was fascinating. So eventually, I went back to that cave with ropes and lights and stuff like that. And if you got back to the back of where the sunlight hit, there was a vertical shaft that went all the way down in the cave, about 30 feet, and you could get in it and put your hands on both sides and push and kind of shimmy all the way down. Yeah. And when you got to the bottom, it opened up into a room, and I eventually proposed to my wife in that cave. I thought that was pretty cool. Did you really? Yeah. It was a place that I no one knew about. don't know that I ever asked you where you proposed to your wife. Yeah, I hiked huh. up there and I uh, I put like blankets and flowers and stuff in there and you know we we said some nice words and stuff. But but I was like, hey, let's go exploring. And I took her up there and we went down in the cave and you know I had everything all prepared and I was like, hey, this is a really cool place that nobody knows about and I just wanted to propose to you down here. And I never thought about it really because from her perspective, that probably was weird. You know, I was pretty sure she was going to say yes. But like if you're, I don't know, looking back at it, if I was a young lady and somebody took me to a cave and was like, hey, right, will you right. marry me? <laughs> and what if I say no? Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't think that part through. particular place, right. And why do you have that bag of quicklime? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally unrelated. It was really neat. I had a uh, propane lantern down there and it was just really cool. Wow, man. That's lovely. I think what was so special about it is it was a place only I knew about, and I got there by exploring. Right. And so when Which these... is kind of a metaphor for what you would hope a really healthy marriage would be. Yeah, I think so. 
But if you think about these people back in the day, they're in a boat and they live on an island and they're like, hey, I wonder what's over the horizon. I don't know. Let's just go. And then they would go in the boat and then they would find the next island. But how, how far do you push out into the unknown before you find something? Because there's, there's Not two- Not that far. What do you mean? That's too, it's too far. I <laughs> just- What's the furthest offshore you've ever swam? Swim, swam, swam, swam? Not at all, dude. I mean, I crossed the Tennessee River one time to say that I swam across the river. I did okay. that. Yeah. But you've gone like snorkeling off of a coast or something, right? You're talking about I'm standing on dirt and then I go off with nothing but yes. my, my body power? Correct. How far have you gone? Maybe. What's the furthest you've ever been from land just swimming? Maybe a couple hundred yards, like in a float or something. Maybe. Okay. In a float. Yeah. Yeah. My friend Brett and I were in Nicaragua and we kind of had to get past some real rough stuff. It's an area called the Corn Islands off the eastern coast of Nicaragua. And you got to swim to get out to the reef. It's not like Hawaii where the reef starts, I mean, at the edge of the waves. It's a long ways. And so we got way out there and then, you know, it was pretty fish and stuff and you're just kind of floating and swimming along. And then we looked up and we were like, we're very, very far from a place where you could stand. This isn't good. And I don't think either of us panicked, but it was a long haul back in there. I mean, you, you look at an island from a plane or, or whatever And you imagine there's just, you know, miles of exploring you could do in that pretty shallow light blue water around islands. But when you're actually there, it doesn't take very far out there to start getting pretty freaky. And so you're talking about exploring these islands the same way you would talk about going and getting into a cave or me pulling up the grate and trying to explore the catacombs across the street or your kids going out in the woods or my kids going out into the woods or on a long hike and you're like, just one more hill, just one more hill. But those things aren't terrifying because I can walk on them and I'm used to walking and yet I can breathe when I'm standing on ground. But this is just unending ocean, man. Unfathomably huge volumes of water. No, I'm not sure I do get the impulse to get in a boat and go and figure that out. I feel it when I'm in the woods. I don't feel it when I'm a couple hundred yards offshore swimming. So, no, I I think there's something crazy about these people. Yeah, that's a fair point. Like, that's why I think it's not unlike space, because you have a certain amount of resources that can sustain you on your boat. Yeah, you can fish. That's, That's one good thing you can do in the ocean that you can't do in space, but you have to be able to survive with what you've brought. And the navigation techniques and tactics that you use, that's everything. That either gets you somewhere or don't. But what's so what's so amazing to me is that when you when you do some type of navigation, there's this term I looked up on Wikipedia, it's called wayfinding. And wayfinding, okay. Wayfinding, yeah. And so it is just what it sounds. You're trying to find your way to a certain location. And one of the key things that you have to do is you have to orient yourself to your surroundings. And then once you've oriented yourself, then you can start trying to pick a direction and a decision in the route that you're moving. You know, you're moving west or whatever it is. And once you start moving in that direction, at that point, you have to monitor your ability to move in that direction. Wait, so, so this is like like an activity, like geocaching, or this is a uh, a category of studying human behavior? Like this is a thing humans do intuitively. What are you talking about here? Yeah, it's it's like what you do. If you wanted to go from where you're standing, right? What state are you in right now? Right now, I am in Nebraska, near Sioux City, Iowa. Okay, if you wanted to get to Alabama from Nebraska, what would you do to begin with? If Everything was gone and I had to walk and there were no maps? Um, I don't know. Just how would you do it? Like well, right if, now, just today? As things are right this second, I know how to get to Alabama from Sioux City, Iowa. So I would just follow the interstate highway system. It's clearly marked. Okay. And I suppose I would take I-29 all the way down to Kansas City. Then I would cut down towards Springfield through the Branson area across to Memphis and then down your direction cutting through the corner of Mississippi. Okay, that's how you'd do it. Mm-hmm. So 
you know these different roads that exist and, and you know how to get on them, but as you're going along the way, you would continuously update your knowledge base as you go, right? Sure, yeah, okay. Okay, so the problem with what they did back in the day is they didn't have that final place that they were going. That's what's so fascinating to me about finding all these islands in the Pacific. They started at a location, and they just picked a a bearing and went. But the interesting thing about that is they didn't know where they were ultimately going to end up. You were just going and going until you found land. And once you found land, then you could reorient yourself to that land, but you didn't know it was there until you, you just went a crazy far distance out in the middle of nowhere. But like if, if you and I played Battleship here and we just took a map of Oceania and if we blew up that map to the size where the tip of a dart would represent the visible range of a human in a boat at sea level. So this is a big map. And then we took those darts and we stood at a certain distance and just hurled them at the map. You're never going to hit land. And you're going to be like 99.999% water and you're not seeing anything. Or at least that would be my guess. I guess I just feel like even if there were twice as many islands in the South Pacific or North Pacific Ocean, maybe it makes more sense. But it just feels like there's nothing. You're just going off into the wilderness of nothing and an ocean that badly wants to kill you. It just feels like you should never find anything. And that's not mathematic. That's just my intuition but think about it a different way like if did you do any of the research on how they navigated back in the day yeah i did i did and so yeah i've learned more about it since i asked you the question initially but at this point in the conversation i'm trying instead of pretending like i know a whole bunch that i entirely gleaned from reading i'm trying to just give you the honest take on how i felt about it when i was sizing it up for the first time i think about it this way so if if you are going straight across the ocean and you look left or right, let's say you're 100 miles out and you're looking left or right, how far can you see to the horizon? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, I don't I know. Don't, um, I don't either. That's a quick Google away. 20 miles? Yeah, that's what I'm assuming, something like that. So if you can see left and right that far, it's like a, a circle. A circle of data observation is moving with you. Okay. So if anything bumps into that circle on either side of you, assuming that you're traveling during the day, at that point, you you have known information at that location. And if you're good at keeping data, you can go back. So you can go out 100 miles, assuming you can keep a straight bearing, and then you can turn around and come back. By the way, moving against the wind is a completely different scenario, right? 8.37 miles in all directions. That's the Google answer? That's it. So you've got a 16, roughly a 16 and a half mile diameter that you could take in land if you were to come close to it. That's cool. That's cool. So that's what I would do if, let's say I was great at driving a boat or a, sailing a, a canoe of some sort, I would just go out in one direction and then come back. And then the following week, I would angle 10 degrees to the right and I would do the same thing. And then I would angle 10 degrees to the right and do the same thing. That's how I would do it. The following week, you wouldn't be back in a week. I mean, if I went out 100 miles. Wow, but even then. uh, So the distance between Tahiti and Hawaii, and the thinking is that Hawaii was settled by Tahitians, it's like 24, 2500 miles. Yeah, that's freaking crazy. <laughs> it's freaking crazy, dude. You, would, I, you wouldn't you would do this systematic, like it sounds good. What you're saying sounds so good. And maybe you would do that if you were exploring like your neighborhood or a hilly part of the country. But every time you go out, you are subject to all of those elements and all of that risk. And are you sure you're going to even be able to find your way back? I mean, what if you go out... 20 times and on 19 of them, the weather cooperates and you're good. But on the 20th, you get blown to who knows where. There's no 21st trip. You're just dead. So before you even get into like, how would you break down the grid, which I think you're asking the right question there. I'm still just hung up on the human psychology that would say it's worth the risk. We got to do this. All right. So what are we at this week, boys? Well, this week we're exploring the 2200 mile radius around our island. That's so stinking. I mean, how far is 2,200 miles 
across the United States. That's got to be like Huntsville, Alabama to what? Denver? I have no idea. But California? It's far. We're talking about you and me, though. We're we're soft, dude. <laughs> we are so soft. <laughs> we're pudgy, weak, soft. We are. I mean, the people that we're talking about here, they all have six packs. Yes. They uh they build their own rope. <laughs> they do. They have those shoulders. Have you seen the show? I mean, there's a reason the Samoans are absolutely dominant at things like football. The shoulders on those people. How much torque and power would it take to move a boat that long? I mean, that is not for people who look like me. <laughs> have you yeah. have you seen my shoulders? I have. I have, yeah. I don't think I'm prepared to paddle 2,400 miles, but like Dwayne Johnson, he might have that. He could probably do it. He could probably do it. God, that guy, That if he ran for president, he would win, by the way. I don't even know what he thinks, and I might vote for him. Yeah, I know. He would win. That'd be weird. It'd be weird to vote for a candidate who won. That's not really my lot in life. <laughs> yes, I haven't <laughs> done that in a long time either. No, I just <laughs> I just vote for things that lose all the time. I still have to do that. whatever wins. I have to work with that. But my things don't win. They never win. This episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Away. Away is really what you should buy if you are traveling anywhere at any time, whether it be in a canoe, <laughs> on the open ocean. I saw where you were the, going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably in an airplane, though, let's be honest. Right? Definitely for an airplane. I mean, it's really, really fitted well for that. Yeah. So this is the way it worked for us. For years and years and years, I bought like these roller bags and they would break one of the wheels would fall off blah 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 and i would buy another one and another one and then i got an away and this away travel bag just solved all the problems because it was well engineered and i'm assuming the one that you have now did the same for you matt it's incredible the first one that i had which is a couple of generations back is the best piece of luggage i've ever had ever until the new one i got which is the current iteration and it's just bliss. I don't use anything else. Everything else has been benched or sold or given away or whatever. I only use the away bag at this point. Yeah, it solves everything. It's got these really cool casters. They spin 360 degrees. So I like to push it out in front of me. And you can, I don't know, if I'm just standing in line, I'll just sit there and spin it. It's hard to explain. Yes. But do you do the little fidget thing where you just spin I it around? I do the fidget thing. And what I like to do is to push it out in front of me with a twist. Uh -huh. to switch hands because I feel really stylish. Can you picture this? Yeah. So you got the bag is vertical. I'm not pulling it on two wheels. It's on all four wheels. Okay. And then I've got my extended handle up there and it's in my right hand. And I'm like, I want to reach into my right pocket to get my phone. And so what I'll do is I'll just on the tile floor of the airport, I will spin one rotation, pushing the bag forward, reach into my right pocket to pull out my phone, put it to my ear as my left hand just arrives where the bag has spun to. And I look like the most stylish person in the entire airport if it weren't for my face. That's really good. I haven't arrived at that maneuver yet. That's pretty good. It feels like it would go in like a dance sequence. Sometimes I'll just push it out in front of me and then catch up to it. But I like the spin move, man. I'm not quite it. at the spin move yet. Well, yeah. you can be there. You just, I mean, you just got to go do it. Now you know. So which one do you have? Do you have the carry-on or the bigger carry-on? I have the bigger carry-on, which has worked... In literally every situation, they clearly went and talked to all the people who make the regulations on the airlines. They're like, this is the size we're going to make this thing. And it is exactly the size it's supposed to be. Never an issue. Yeah, it's awesome. So if you would like to get an away bag and solve all of your luggage problems, go to awaytravel.com slash NDQ19 and use the promo code NDQ19 during checkout. You get 20 bucks off if you use that promo code. There are certain regulations about how you can lock carry-on bags, and they got that thing dialed as well. So it's it, the TSA approves of how the lock works, but the two zippers effectively come together and clip in the top at this little spinny combination lock thing. Again, ridiculously stylish. If for some reason all these really good reasons to get a bag just still has you a little, little scared for some reason, then let me put your mind at ease. You can get a 100-day trial of this thing, and if for some reason you don't like it, they'll just take it back because they're cool like that. But you will like it, so you don't have to worry about this trial, but it's there just in case we haven't convinced you enough. A 100-day trial, 
If you don't like it, they'll take it back. But let's face it, you're going to love it. So for $20 off any suitcase or bag, visit awaytravel.com slash NDQ19 and then use the promo code NDQ19 during checkout. It's good for any kind of travel. Going to see the family for the holidays, put everything in the away bag. It's going to work for you. Going to try to find another island in the Pacific Ocean that's 2,500 miles away and you're in a double hold ancient style Polynesian canoe raft, throw the away bag in there. <laughs> You're laughing, but I actually have taken it into some pretty crazy situations. Sorry, I didn't hear me laugh. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. It works everywhere. <laughs> there you go. Thanks to away for sponsoring the program. Thanks to you for trying out the sponsors. This is a great product. Very excited to hear what you think about it. So the research I did says that uh, one of the main things they did is they created these star maps, these mental maps of the sky. Mental maps? Yeah. I mean, you learn it by putting sticks on the ground and you map out the stars on the horizon, but you commit all that to memory. That's what I understood from what I read. Okay. So you'd have, it would go something like this. You got a smart dude in your village or smart lady in your village that knows all the stuff. And she tells you these stories about these different stars that do these different things. And you put your island in the center of this polar coordinate system. Okay. And all along the circle on the outside of where your island is, you have these different stars on the horizon. The way they would commit these to memory is they would have different types of I don't know, like folklore or, you know, mythology or whatever it was that goes along with it. And I kind of laughed at that until there's this guy that goes to church with me. He's part of the Von Braun Astronomical Society. And we went up to the planetarium one time and he said, hey, we're going to we're going to tell you the stars Southern style or I forget what he what he called it. But he took us up there to the planetarium where Von Braun used to hang out. And they projected all the stars up into the sky. Have you ever been to a planetarium like that? Absolutely. So he projected all these stars onto the ceiling, and he told us stories. He's like, you see that one right there? That's, uh, you know, and he, w- he would say, that's Canis Minor, Canis Major, whatever. That's the little hot dog, right? Over here, we've got Jethro the Hunter. Of course, it's Orion. And if you'll look down on Jethro's belt, he's got uh, a GPS that he uses to keep up with everything in the sky. And of course, that's the, do you know about the little cluster of galaxies on Orion's belt? Yeah, I've stared at that stuff for a long time. He told us about all these things in our own culture. Like, he's like, oh yeah, and this is where they jump on the pickup truck. And, you know, that's where his dog ran away. And by the end of this little hour long presentation it was kind of tongue in cheek and it was all like ha 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 look how redneck we are we're learning this stuff but by the end of it i was like whoa i kind of know stuff now i've got this yeah that mnemonic device thing it's real dude yeah there, there's cheats and shortcuts we've talked about this before that i've used from ages past in school and any time i used a memory device to commit something to my brain, I still have it. And stuff that I didn't, the only reason I still have it is because I use it a lot. But even if I don't use something that I committed to memory with a trick, I have it forever. Right. And so you're saying that's how they painted these mental maps of the stars was with legends and myth and storytelling. That's my understanding from what I've read. So imagine... Well, Well, hold on. Like just... That's incredible that... The mingling of religion and myth and like the most important trade or human technique that these people had, it was all mushed together into one thing. I mean, that's fascinating to me. So I'm getting most of this from, there's a lot of different resources for this. The Polynesian Voyaging Society is really interesting. That I am familiar with. Yeah, they recreated this boat, and they sailed literally around the entire world with it. It's called Hakulea. Hakulea, yeah. I don't think they went around the whole world. They didn't circumnavigate the globe. No, they went around the whole world. They did? Yeah, this society, they reproduced this boat in the 70s, and it's since literally been around the entire world. Really? In in one voyage? No, 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 no. They, They broke it up. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. 
there was an impulse toward that. There was a guy from maybe Norway in the 1940s, Thor. It was a Trivial Pursuit question. That's the first time I ever remember hearing about it. Thor Heyerdahl, Heyerdahl, something like that. And he had, um, he had this theory that parts of Polynesia were maybe settled by people from South America or vice versa. I don't know. It's been a while since I've looked at this, but he put together this float, this kind of raft thing called the Contiki raft and sailed with a bunch of other, I assume, Scandinavians in the 1940s and then wrote a book about it. And I never read the book. I'm looking this up. Is this Thor Pedersen? Heyerdahl. There it is. Just found it. Okay. Yeah. Thor Heyerdahl. And it is the Contiki Expedition, 1947. That's in the ballpark. So this thing, what I, I what I know more about this than the expedition itself is that it kind of captured people's imagination. And it's one of the last high adventure, 19th century romanticism era things that happened in the West. Because, you know, in the 19th century, you had your missionaries and your explorers, David Livingston. Everybody knew about what was going on with David Livingston, the famous explorer who was in Zambia and, you know, the heart of Africa. And then he went missing. And I mean, all of that legendary stuff was what captured the public imagination and the dispatches from these kind of explorers was what everybody talked about. It was, I mean, it was the entertainment of the day. And so I know about the Contiki expedition, but I had never heard of the uh, Hokulea. Am I saying that right? Uh, it, yes, I, th- I think it's Hokulea. I, I pulled up a news thing. I'll, I'll find it for us. Okay. Yeah. I'd never heard of the Hokulea expedition until I asked this question and we started poking around at it. But that's kind of wild to me because the Contiki thing, it looks like they maybe did that once and it looks like they maybe, maybe cut a couple of corners, if I recall correctly, in terms of supervision and making sure it was safe. But this Hakulea thing, they didn't use any navigation techniques other than what the ancient ones had figured out. Is that correct? That's my understanding. There's this gentleman that uh, explained some of the stuff. So, so first of all, you had to know this ring of stars around your island. And okay. there's also other things you had to understand, like the, the swells in the sea. This was something that blew my mind. So I don't know. If you were to think about it right now, about navigating to Alabama, you think in terms of north, south, east, west. Correct. So you have a global coordinate system in your mind. Yes, you, I do. You, I, I kind of think of a Cartesian coordinate plane. X and Y axis, X Mm -hmm. being east, west, Y being north, south. But if you were on an island back in the day, what do you have above your head? Like, how do you orient yourself? And it's a hemisphere. You have the sun, it rises in one place and it goes into the other and it travels in an arc along the sky. And so you're thinking in terms of hemisphere. And if you position yourself at the bottom of that, then pretty quickly you... You orient yourself in in terms of polar coordinates. Like, I can go in the direction of this star, or I can go in the direction of that star. And the stars meeting the horizon, or where they do meet the horizon, that is a particular arc or angle in this polar coordinate system. You with me? Right. So once you learn all the, the stories that tell you which direction which star is, and you understand, oh, there's an island in that direction this far... It's just like a vector in math. You have a a bearing and a distance. That's what you have. But in order to get to that bearing and distance, you have to overcome two things. If if the wind is moving, let's for you and I, we have simple soft brains. Let's think in terms of we're going to go north northeast, right? So if I want to go north northeast in the direction of let's just name a star. I don't know Canis Major. I just made that up. I don't know where it is in the sky. Okay. If if we're going to go in the direction of uh, that star, we don't point our boat north northeast. We have to point it in a direction that takes into account the wind, but also the movement of the seas. Those are two separate things. So it's not like a video game. You don't just point your vehicle or your character in a direction and push up on the control stick. There are factors working against you, which are also the factors that propel you, which makes that really interesting. Exactly. So if I if I want to go north northeast. In our soft brains, that's straight up and a little bit to the right. 
Sure. But in order to do that, I might point east because of uh, depending on how fast my boat goes, depending on where the wind is, you know, or maybe not completely east. Maybe I'll point like east northeast, and then the swells or, or the ocean currents are going to push me at a certain speed in a certain direction, and the wind is going to push me in a certain speed in a certain direction. So if you go back to that that concept of wayfinding. We've got the orientation. We know where we want to go. We want to go towards that star. And we're going to decide on that route. We're going to go in that direction. But the most important thing that we have to do is we have to monitor ourselves along that route. So if you and I decide to point east, northeast, and we start going in that direction, but instead of going north, northeast, we end up going northeast, that matters when we're talking about these distances. It matters a oh, lot. Oh, sure. Yeah. But if you have all your stories down and you right. know where the bear battled the cat and the scorpion attacked the goat and all of those different things, right? you can theoretically make corrections or micro adjustments each night when you can see the stars. Right. Or the sun. What happens if you can't see the stars for a week? Oh, well, so in my mind, I was like, well, you're hosed at that point. But getting into the weeds on this stuff and reading this stuff, these guys could read the currents and they could read the swells of the oceans. But how do you accumulate that data in the first place? Did you find the Marshall Island stick chart? Did you find that? No, I saw uh, Mao Pileg, I think it's how you say the guy's name. I don't know what you're the talking about. Micronesian guy. I saw him doing a stick chart on an island. Google real quick just to get get our, our our minds in the same place. You're gonna have to take me to where you're going in a second. Okay. I don't I don't know that yet. Let me show you what I know, and then you show me what you know. So that sounds good. G- Google Marshall Island stick chart. Marshall Island stick chart. Okay. Stick map. There we go. All right. Let's see what we got. Oh oh. What Isn't that crazy? Am I looking at. Yeah. Okay. So are you on Wikipedia or where are you at? Uh, I'm just on Google. I'm not even into the Wikipedia thing yet. No way. I know. Exactly. Isn't that cool? You have got to be kidding me. No, no. Is this, this, is, this, is, this is not what it looks like at first. It, what does it look like? Tell me what you think it looks like. Uh, just describe it. Describe it for the third chair and then tell me what you think it is without reading. It looks like something that was in the set decorator's mind for the Blair Witch Project. It, it's like just some stupid sticks yeah. and stuff, and they're all layered over each other. It looks like maybe like a dream catcher or what non-Native Americans imagine a dream catcher would look like. But what I think it is, because well, well, I see all of these little... Before okay. you explain mm-hmm. what it's made of and explain how it's bound together, explain it for the third chair real quick before you go any further. Yeah, okay, sorry. I'm, I'm excited. This is interesting to me. It looks like a bunch of little sticks about the size of a large book that you would be holding open in front of you. It is in a 16 by 9 orientation, as we are used to, and it's mostly negative space, but there are just a lot of sticks tied together. You know, there's a few spaces where you could reach your hand through it, but all the sticks seem to be tied together haphazardly, but... I'm of the impression that this haphazard connection isn't so haphazard. Also, on the sticks, there are a few small burls and little bits of looks like fiber or string tied to mark certain intersections of the sticks. And I think those are significant. I haven't read ahead yet because I don't want to uh, spoil the Christmas present. So now tell me what it actually is. Okay, so I thought... When I first looked at these things, uh, apparently this was commonly used only by the people in the Marshall Islands. This was a very specific thing made there. And so I thought, oh, well, obviously this is a map. And the intersections of all of these these sticks would represent islands or something like that. That's no. what I thought. Okay, so here's what I think. Can I give you my theory? Uh, y- yeah. I think you hold it up to the sky in a certain direction and it lines up stars at certain times a year. We're both wrong. Dang it. Okay, <laughs> we're, well, both, I, we're both wrong. All right, tell me what it is. So these are maps used in the Marshall Islands to 
Explain ocean swell patterns. No. As the ocean flows and and goes towards islands underneath the water, you have a, a more shallow area as it approaches an island. And, you know, obviously when you're out sure. at sea, it's deeper. And so sure. this is a representation of the refraction of water as it goes around an island. I would have never thought of this ever. What? Yeah. So if you're getting so on wait, your boat. Wait, wait, wait. So this is not a map of like, this is how all the swells and currents work. This is a representation of how all the swells and currents work in relationship to a specific island? So it's a map of the way the water flows in the ocean. And out in a certain location, you know that the water goes in this certain direction. Okay, so let me just play a little bitty clip from this gentleman. He's a really smart guy. His name is Nanoa Thompson. He's a navigator. Um, He was on the the Hakulea... Hakula A boat, and he's actually piloted this thing. And um, this is like a local news sort of thing. K H O N 2. I'm assuming that's Honolulu news. Honolulu, yep. And she's asking him, How do you feel the ocean water beneath you in the boat? And uh, apparently, people in like Tahiti and things of that nature and, and over in Polynesia, they would they would sail directions based on the sky and the wind, but the Marshall Islands, they thought a lot about the currents and and the sea swells and things like this. So listen to what this guy has to say. Okay. If it's cloudy, read the ocean waves. To Tahiti, waves generated by the easterly trades. Not always easy in choppy seas or when you can't see them, when it's solid cloud cover and at night. Like Ma would say, if you can read the wave, you're never lost. So your job, if you're going to Tahiti and you're heading south, you want to have the wave come from the east. If you're looking forward in the canoe, it go through your left foot and come out your right foot. That's how you do it. You hear what he said? So yes, I heard what he said. So if That's you're unreal, if, if you're facing south, going towards Tahiti from where he's at in Hawaii, and and then you want the wave to come from the left side of the boat, come through your left foot and go out your right foot. And that's reading the ocean. So I thought you just looked at the stars in the sky and things of that nature. But apparently, you can actually read the water itself. Because the water is going to change based on how deep the ocean is at any place. And it, it's, I mean, think about it. You've got a whole ocean of water flowing towards Hawaii. If you're on the left, like if, if, if you're looking straight at Hawaii... It's going to act like a funnel, or no, a wedge, really. And it's going to, all the water is going to have to go around it to the left and around it to the right. And as that water gets pushed to the left, it's going to change the way it flows. It's a restriction, right? Yeah, of course it will. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's so obvious now. So these stick charts that we're looking at here, they explain what the water does as it approaches certain islands. And what these people would do is they would build these stick charts to understand it, or based on memory or whatever, and then they would memorize it. It's literally a mental map of how the waves work, and then they just wouldn't look at it when they were sailing. (laughs) That's what they said. I mean, I I have to take it on. That's incredible. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? I would have never, ever, ever come up with this. And did did you make your way to... Well, I want to take you somewhere with Captain Cook, but you you were going to take me somewhere that I didn't know. What was it? Well, to your point that you just brought up, though, like you would think of it eventually if there were like 50 generations of you. This is just the kind of stuff that I think you gradually wrap your brain around culturally. I mean, there's not one eureka moment, I don't think, in all of this where like one lady was sitting there and she's like, wait a dang minute. Here's how the whole ocean works. Now we can go do the thing. I mean, you, you got to try it out and trying it out takes weeks or months every single time. People have to, I mean, you're going to, people are going to die to get this data and figure it out. Now we can Google it, but, but people had to be, had to be lost at sea. It's just a price you had to pay for someone to be able to come back with this information. It's the, the unbelievable cost of time, of thought, of even life, 
of resources that went into making this picture I'm looking at that's like 30 sticks tied together. That's just unbelievable to me. It's wild, isn't it? It's wild. Yeah. Who would have thought that this would so trip my wonder trigger, but boy, does it. So th- this uh, Mao Peleg, Peleg guy, mm-hmm. did you see his name at all come up when you were looking at things? No, I did not. Okay. Let me see if I can get the story right. The people of Hawaii, as with a lot of Native American people, which is a kind of a stretch when you're talking about Hawaii because they're Native North Pacific Islanders, but, you know, Native American because it's close to America. I don't know, whatever term you want to use. As with a lot of people in the 1960s and 70s, there was this impulse to say, eh, something's getting wrecked with our culture here. And we still have living memory and connections with the people who were around long enough to know people who were alive before it was wrecked. So we're only kind of one step removed from this really icky century of existence that um, that did a lot of damage to the cultural memory of Native people all around the world. You Well, I, I'm in South Dakota now, right? And you remember the stories about all of the Native American protests and uprising isn't really the right word, but even standoffs that got kind of hostile over this sort of defiant insistence on preserving something that was being lost. And so what I didn't know is that that same impulse was present amongst the Hawaiian people in the 1970s. And as a group of these folks got to thinking about it, they were like, well, really, what is our thing? What is the thing that makes us us and unique amongst all the people of the world? And there were probably a lot of things they thought of, but like there couldn't be an us without the knowledge of navigation on the high seas. We got to figure out how we used to do this before this becomes another one of those bits of knowledge that are lost to history and and never to be recovered. And so they decided that they wanted to make a sailing vessel, a canoe that could make the trips to prove, to confirm, and not just to prove and confirm that that this is how they got to Hawaii in the first place culturally, but I don't know, to recapture a connectedness with the thing that got them there and the spirit that kind of made them them. And these are words I heard from people I was reading there. I don't think I'm inflicting this on the people of Hawaii. And so this team goes out to figure out how they're going to navigate it. And they think they can build the boat, but they want to get to Tahiti, French Polynesia, 2,500 miles away. They don't know anybody who knows how to do it. So they go on this like Cinderella style, go around and figure out who has the foot that'll fit the slipper kind of search to find anybody in the Pacific ocean who still knows how to navigate like this. And they ask around and they get nothing. And eventually they end up in Micronesia at this little tiny Island called Satawal. I'd never heard of it before. And there is this guy who lives there named Mao or Ma. And he apparently had been taught by the elders who had been taught by the elders who had been taught by the elders, how to do this type of navigation. And they convinced him to come to Hawaii and show them how to do it so that the knowledge would not be lost. And I'm telling you, man, it looks like this knowledge was like less than a handful of people away from going completely extinct. And then we would only have to guess as to how people used to do it. But just in the nick of time, they encounter this gentleman and he shows them how to do it. And so they put together this boat, they put together this crew, and somewhere in the 1970s, I don't remember when, they successfully navigate with nothing from Hawaii to Tahiti. Again, like 2,500 miles. And they don't lose anybody. It sounds like the trip got a little bit tense, but they get the thing done. And then they use this vessel to sail all over the place, including to, and I don't remember the original name, but I, I think it's Easter Island which is like the most remote chunk of earth on the whole planet. Just amazing. Is it Hakulea? Hakulea the is the name of the, the boat, yeah. So my question is this, are we about at the end of our ability to understand this with just the two of us? 
No, I don't think we're at the end. There's one other thing I would like to explain that I read about, and okay. then I think we are at the end. <laughs> oh, that's and, it. Okay, you're the knower yeah. <laughs> of where the end is. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, you know Captain Cook, right, who sailed all the way around yeah. the world? Sure. Okay. Did, did you hear about the one guy they found in Tahiti, and they, they just asked him a bunch of questions? Did you hear about this guy? No, I, I absolutely not. What's the deal? Okay, so there's this document that I've been reading. It's by a guy named Ben Feeney. Finney? Ben Finney? Yeah, that's it. B-E-N-F-I-N-N-E-Y. This, unfortunately, this Mr. Finney apparently died in 2017, so we missed the boat on talking to him, pun intended. However, Captain Cook went to Tahiti, and he did a weird thing. Usually, Europeans would just drop in and like, hey, we're going to trade you some stuff. Look, this is steel. Give us all your good stuff kind of thing. They actually hung out at Tahiti for a while, and they learned some of the language. And they got to the point where they could communicate, and they met this one person. They call them, is the word, I've only seen the word written down, but I've never heard it. Polymath? Polymath? A person that knows a lot of things. What knows a lot about a lot of different stuff. Yeah, polymath. Polymath. So they met a polymath on the island of Tahiti, and his n- name was Tupai. I think this is awful. T U P A I A. Tupaya. Tupaya. Maybe. Okay, that sounds good. So anyway, they get to the point where they could communicate in broken words, and they sat down with this guy, and they're like, "Okay, man, tell us what you know. Like, what are the islands around us?" And he sat down and started drawing, and he was able to identify like 70 islands around them, and it covered 40 degrees of longitude and 20 degrees of latitude. That's like the... Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Help me understand that. 40 degrees, you said, of longitude. It's like the size of the continental U.S. Yeah. Okay, here's the upshot. In 1769, they sat down... And they started talking to this guy. And I'm just going to read straight from this uh, document by Mr. Finney here. It says, The chart, which apparently is a copy of a lost original, shows Tahiti at the center with 74 islands arranged around it. Many of the islands cannot now be exactly identified. However, and among those that can be identified, some were misplaced, apparently because the British did not properly understand Tahitian directional terms. After restoring the islands in question to their proper position, it can be arguably said that the chart indicated that Tupai had a wide, if inexact, knowledge of the islands spread over 40 degrees of longitude and 20 degrees in latitude, an oceanic realm larger than the continental United States. That's crazy, man. That is unbelievable. I mean, and I'm not using the word as a throwaway. If you didn't have tangible proof, which you do, I would say, I'm sorry, I I just have to call bull crap on that. That's unknowable with what they had to work with. And yet somehow it was knowable. That's shocking. It's literally a mental map. You're not describing a situation where Tupai unrolled a map and put it in front of Captain Cook. He dictated the map through broken language and they wrote down the map. Is that my understanding? Yes, it was literally a mental map. So he sat down and he's like, okay, well, I know the stars are like this. And so if you go in that direction, this is where the thing is. And what's so interesting (sighs) is the chart is written by the British here and it's drawn in Cartesian coordinates, more or less. There's four quadrants here. It's fascinating. So you think about this though. How much could you, I mean... You certainly would be uh, on the short list of smartest people I've ever met. No, not true. How much, <laughs> so you know all the people I've met, then you're <laughs> the number one on the list of smartest people I've ever met. You <laughs> can't win this. You lose, Shut except up. the compliment. You're either going to look like a jerk or you're going to look like somebody who got a nice compliment. Take the one okay. where you get the nice compliment. Thank all right, you. So you're welcome. So you picture even like the smartest people you know. You're like, all right, give me a mental map of your surroundings. How far out would your mental map be accurate from your home as the the center point? Five miles, 10 miles, 15? When would it start to break down, do you think? I, I, I've thought about this, and the way my mental map works is it works along roads. And so, like, if you go 
west from here along a certain highway, I can take you all the way down that highway and I can tell you what's on each side of the road the whole way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm shocked because when I look at a map from the top down, God's eye view, I see that that road is not straight. I didn't Mm -hmm. even notice this turn almost to the north. I didn't even notice that turn back to the south because to me, it's just like, oh, well, about 300 yards past the McDonald's is the whatever. It's just bizarre, man. I I agree. I think that deterioration happens really fast. And I think, oh, you, you know I what? Think if the third chair hit pause right now and they did the exercise, like don't look at a map, but just communicate details to somebody else in the car with you or whatever and take it out as far as you can and then look at a map, I think, or just draw a map of your surroundings and then actually look. I think you will find that your brain lies to you about how much you actually know about this tiny little area that you live in, let alone an area the size of the continental United States. But you were trying to say something. Go ahead. I have data. I I just realized I had data. Okay. So Jeremy Fielding and I, we had to load a truck onto a trailer down in Smoke Rise, Alabama, which is a city I did not know existed. It's got a good name. Only like 40 miles from here. It's no spearfish, but that's pretty good. Yeah, no. About 40 minutes away, his truck broke down. I went down and we loaded his truck on a trailer and we were having problems getting it on the trailer. And so we used, guess what? A snatch block. Snatch block. Yeah, (laughs) snatch block to get it up on the trailer. And this dude stops to help us. And he helped us get it up on the trailer. And I wanted to say thank you. So I wanted to take him something. And uh, so I called him. He told me, well, it's like this, man. I ain't got no cell phone. I got tired of hearing that thing ring. So I just done away with it. But if you want to, you can call my girlfriend. She'll get in touch with me. And then we can meet up then. I said, all right, man, let's do that. So I called his girlfriend and his name is Jeff. I said, Jeff, I want to come down there and give this to you. Where do I meet you? He's like, well, you're up there. I'm down here. How about halfway? I was like, all right, what's halfway? About Coleman. Coleman work for you. A bunch of exits. Which one you want to meet at? And I said, well, dude, I let's see. You got the, <laughs> there's Highway 69. Yeah, Highway 69. You turn off there to the left and you go over to the lake. We could meet over there. And so he's thinking from the south, Smith Lake is in a certain location. I'm thinking from the mm-hmm. north, I have to turn the opposite direction. And we're thinking about what exits to meet at. Mm-hmm. And we're about to navigate to each other with no cell phone coverage. When's the last time you did that? I can tell you the last time I thought about it was a couple of weeks ago, but it has been a very, uh, overseas travel would be the last time I've done it. Trying to coordinate signals with people on that trip I led to Rome a couple of summers ago who didn't have phones. We were 20 minutes away from the meeting spot and it took me an hour to get there. I kid you not because, because I went straight down South on interstate 65 Mm -hmm. and he said, he said in the conversation, yeah, highway 69, turn over there to go to the lake. Well, there's three exits that you can turn to get to the lake. And I said, is that exit 308? I don't know. And so we got lost. There were three exits that had signs for Highway 69 on it. I stopped at every one of them and could not find his blue truck, which was the indicator of him. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I eventually called his girlfriend, and I was like, hey, is Jeff there? She's like, no, he left as soon as y'all got off the phone. (laughs) And I said, where is he going? I heard him say something about exit 308. And I was like, well, daggum, I guess I'm going to exit 308. So I turned back around, took us an hour, dude, eventually found him. My point is, it's really hard to navigate when you don't have a cell phone to call somebody in the last 100 yards of where you're trying to meet them. Ain't that the truth? Can't do it, dude. And I'm sorry, that took way too long to describe. I apologize. I found it interesting. I find all of this interesting, though, because we're talking about something as simple as how do you get to the place you want to go? And it's something that clearly this conversation is demonstrating that we enormously take for granted. Very competent people in the past had to figure this thing out. And my point, to your point, to my point, is that I think the simple exercise of draw a map of your surroundings and then look at an actual map and find out, see what your deterioration rate is as it goes out, I think it'd be fascinating. I think people would discover shocking things. Here's one that, well, I would say this, I think that we are very much like the people of Oceania in that we attach story to location and navigation. We just don't notice it. So for me, what do you mean? Um, okay. Uh, Texas, 
I got a story attached to Texas, and the story is it's right up against Mexico, and I picture people in cowboy hats and the Alamo and things like that, and I'm from the West, so all of that stuff happened east of me in Texas, which is kind of the place that's halfway between the East and the West, but it's like its own Tex-Mex South thing. It's its own story, right? But then you actually look at a map. El Paso, Texas is west of Denver, Colorado. El Paso, Texas is almost straight in line north-south with Lander, Wyoming. What? What? Yeah, that's the correct response. Huh? Santa Fe, New Mexico is east of El Paso, Texas. Wait, hold on. I'm not making stuff up. Hold on. The one that threw me is you said El Paso was the same north-south as Lander, Wyoming. That can't be right. It's just east. It, It comes in closer to Casper. But yep, it's that far west. What about north and south? Like, where does El Paso, Texas fit north and south? Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. Uh, let me think. Oh, okay. Because again, this this screws with my storytelling. Because what I discovered when I noticed this on a map the other day is that Texas and El Paso, where are they actually? Well, I don't know. I haven't driven through there that much. They, they occupy a place in my mental storytelling map that's very exaggerated. If you go straight south of Omaha, Nebraska... What country in South America do you run into? Straight south of Omaha, Nebraska, I would say Ecuador. And the correct answer would be nothing. Nothing. If you go straight south of Miami, Florida, you'd probably run into Ecuador. Oh, dude, I'm looking at a map. You're absolutely right. Oh, yeah, because I just think about north-south, don't I? Yep, and when you have that primitive drawing in your brain with crayons that is like the, the platonic ideal of North America, South America, Western Hemisphere... You just stack them because it's north-south. And because they have the names north and south, your brain cheats them into a more vertical arrangement when, in fact, you could almost just as easily make a case that there's West America and East America. Oh, wow. You totally could looking at the map. You totally could. Okay, I want to play. I want to play. So if you leave Hawaii, Mm -hmm. what's the first place in the U.S. that you hit? Okay, you're taking a direct line to the U.S.? yeah, from Hawaii. What's the first place in the U.S. you hit away from Hawaii? Orange County. No, it's Alaska. Oh, well, continental, come on. That's cheating. Think about it, though. Alaska. That's wild. It's great. It didn't, it didn't work in the brain, does it? No, no, it doesn't work in the brain. No, all of this stuff is nuts. Here, look at another one. Okay. Look at where London is at in terms of latitude compared with the United States. Okay, yeah, that's weird. Uh, that's I'm looking weird. at the map. It's like what? way up near Greenland. <laughs> yeah, the answer is Canada. Not <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now check out Tokyo. Okay, Tokyo is next to California in my head. Let me scroll over. Uh, huh. Japan is like closer to Oregon, isn't it? It is. That's weird. And the reason that I think this is screwy is in part because we just don't look at maps maybe that much or we don't look at them on that big a scale, but in part because I think we organize all of this a little bit based on story, that this region has a certain feel and in your brain you have a place where you put things that feel like that or look like that or have those kind of stories or historical moments associated with it and things that look like this go over here or or we lump it by weather Like, because we don't think of London as being a super snowy town, but more of like a foggy town. Yeah. We maybe don't think of it as being as northerly as it actually is. And because places like, I don't know, you get what I'm driving at, right? Yep. I think we lie to ourselves in terms of navigation. And so what these ancient seafarers had to figure out on the Pacific was how to divorce themselves from all of those narrative lies and tell themselves the absolute truth about where stuff is or they die. I had no idea how difficult this was. It's pretty fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So are we going to try to get these people on? I'm not done. Yeah, I think we pause the conversation there. We take it beyond our very obviously limited knowledge base on this. And let's just do another conversation about it, but with people who know what they're talking about and see what else we can learn. I'm game, man. Let's do it. That fun. was fun. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for indulging. So stick charts. We've got the little rock stories on the ground. We get all that. 
uh, we got the waves and how like some of those people would actually lay down in the boat so they could feel the waves cross the boat better. It's incredible. I didn't tell you this part. The swells in the ocean, they have four different types of swells and they're named based on the direction they come from. Nope. Did not know that. Yeah. There's, I mean, this gets really, really deep. There's a wind rose where they know what types of wind come from what direction. Let's just get an expert on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do. I'm in. And yep, I got more stuff I want to bounce off you, but as much as I love you, nothing personal, I'd rather bounce it off somebody who's actually been out on this, uh, on the seas doing this stuff. Somebody that's not soft. <laughs> well, I wasn't saying, I mean, maybe kind of, but I think you're saying it too. And I'm not offended. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'm saying If it. I have questions about the geography of Northern Alabama, you are who I want to talk to. Sweet. Thanks. Okay. Just some <laughs> affirmation on the way out the door. All right. All right. Let's, uh, Yeah. Let's get somebody on the horn and do it again next time. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Sweet. Talk to you soon.